beneficial for men. Whereas I, yeah, when I saw this plot first, it seemed to be clearly beneficial for women. It is not difficult to come up with a rationale once you've seen the result. So subgroups. You need to think about limiting the number of subgroups to minimise the chance of concluding falsely that there are differences in their effects. Because again, that could lead to people making decisions that will be harmful. Choose the subgroups carefully, make each one count. It's just the same as the multiplicity and that's why the two are that merged together. Don't smash the data apart in as many different ways as possible just to explore what the individual characteristics might do to the result. Because every time you do that, you're just giving yourself more opportunity to find a false positive. And we can try and correct our mathematics. There are techniques we can use to say, well, if we're going to do that many tests, we really shouldn't just be using a 0.05 threshold. We should lower that threshold. But some of the times, you don't know how many tests you've done. And that's one of the big problems of saying, throwing it at the computer, or having, a, having many looks at the data and saying, well, let's not, form, let's not look formally at blood underlying blood pressure, because it really doesn't look very promising. So let's not formally look at it. You have informally done a test. You should be trying to discount that. And many times when we look at data, we don't really know how many times we're actually analyzing it informally in our own heads and deciding not to pursue that one. So we want a rationale and we want the rationale to be convincing. Because if the rationale is not convincing, maybe people will just you know, dismiss our results anyway. So just to combine together this idea of a multiplicity and subgroups, let's move on to, to an example. This is an example that will be familiar to, to several people in the audience, I'm sure. ISIS-2. Who's heard of ISIS-2? Hands up. Okay, so a few people have heard of ISIS-2. ISIS-2 is a very important trial coordinated by a clinical trial service unit in the 1980s when it, the unit was based in the Radcliffe Infirmary before it was all sort of demolished and cleared and so on. And it's saying, it's saying someone has turned up in hospital with a heart attack. Should we or should we not give them an aspirin? And it's not, ooh, they're, you know, they must be in pain. Get the aspirin. This is because the aspirin might stop that heart attack from getting worse. And this is the trial that showed that aspirin keeps people alive after they've had a heart attack. It's not some of the stuff that be only on the news last week was the, the aspirin in stroke that's now got, seems to have a very beneficial effect on cancer. It's not the aspirin for you're at risk of a heart attack, will this reduce your risk? This is someone has turned up in hospital with a heart attack. We're trying to keep them alive. Does an aspirin help keep them alive for the next 35 days? That's what this trial was about. 17,000 people randomized, no doubt about it, it works. But there are many different types of people with a heart attack. And many different subgroup analyses were proposed and were done for the ISIS-2 trial, and this is one of them. And you don't know what type A and type B are now. This is the overall number of deaths after 35 days. How many people died in the 35 days after they were randomized of a, of a cardiovascular event? 804 in the aspirin group, 1,000 in the placebo group. And when they looked at the subgroups, they said, well, actually, do you know, for type B, there's a very big effect. For type B people, 654, 869, massively significant. These, these are the things that are like the p-value. These are the p-values, but it's nowhere near 0.05, which is the one in 20. This is down at you know, one in a million. This is basically saying that you could have seen this result by chance or something more extreme one time in a million. If you did ISIS-2 a million times and aspirin did nothing, then one time in a million you might see this, and it's less than one time in a million. But they saw this as well, that once we split into type A people and type B people, the type A people, if anything, it's adverse, but there's no power there. It's 150 versus 147. But maybe type A people shouldn't get aspirin. What do you think? Would you want to know if you were in the very unfortunate circumstance of having a heart attack, whether or not you were a type A or a type B person, in order to make a decision about whether or not you want aspirin? Or would you like the medic up at the John Radcliffe Hospital, when you're taken in there, would you like her to decide whether or not you should have an aspirin by first of all figuring out if you're a type A or a type B? What do you think? Would you like to know what type A and type B are? Do you think anyone in the audience is a type A person? Do you know 
your birth signs. Do you know your birth signs? Horoscopes. I, was meant, I meant to bring in the paper so we could have a look at the, uh, today's predictions for people whose birth signs are now about to be revealed. <laughs> Is anyone in the audience a Libra or a Gemini? And would they say, I don't want an aspirin, thank you very much, because that doesn't work for me. This is the real result of ISIS too. Libra and Gemini do not benefit from aspirin. Do you believe it? <laughs> How many subgroup analyses do you think that they did? Do you think there's a biological rationale for Libra or Gemini? No, no there isn't. I mean, one of the, the anecdotes that goes out about this particular uh, subgroup analyses is that one of the principal investigators on the ISIS-2 trial was on a plane, was flying to the States, uh, many years ago when ISIS-2 came out, was sitting next to someone who turned out to, to be Ronald Reagan's astrologer. And so this person, who I'm not going to name, was talking to them, and he said, yeah, we, oh, wow, that's you know, uh, interesting. And in, I remember years ago, um, Dave Sackett, when Dave Sackett, who helped establish the evidence-based uh, medicine masters and so on, um, said um, one of the things that he learned when he took back to Canada with him from Oxford was the multiple meanings of interesting. <laughs> that's very interesting. So this yeah. colleague, uh, oh, that's very interesting that you are the astrologer. I'm sure that's you know, one of those Oxford meanings of the word uh, interesting that means something else. But he said about the result, and he said, well, you know, and of course... Do you think she um, said, oh, no, no, of course, I stroll it, uh, your birth sign wouldn't influence. No, no. You, yes, of course it would. I'm not surprised that the person's birth sign would influence their response to a treatment. So she was then asked, so can you t which birth signs would it be then? Well, that's very difficult. I couldn't possibly say that even on this flight across to the States, I couldn't, I'd need longer to think about exactly what it is. Uh, but could you just tell me what, what, what ones it was? Oh, Libra, Gemini. Well, of course it's Libra and Gemini. And here's a whole series of rationales for why it was Libra and Gemini. And that's the way the conversation apparently uh, went. And it's, but it's not dissimilar to someone saying, you should split it by smoker, non-smoker. You should split it by age. You should split it by diabetic or no diabetic. If you've got a rationale for why aspirin won't work in that population, well, you should split it and you should believe it. If you don't have a rationale, you're going to see things like this. And we have shown this, and yeah, I've shown this, and colleagues have shown this at meetings, and people have come at, up to afterwards and said, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an Aries. Does it work for an Aries? Because uh, they've got something in their head that seems to tell them that this may, means something. We don't believe it means something. Um, but we, yeah, we, I can't be absolutely sure that a Libra or a Gemini uh, wouldn't benefit. I'm not a Libra or a Gemini, but I think if I did have a heart attack, I certainly wouldn't want somebody looking up my birth sign to decide whether or not to treat me. So what do we mean by dice? This is a very important point, because sometimes I said, you know, we, can use tri we can use envelopes for trials, but we frown on envelopes a little bit. But we can use things like this for our big trials. This is my special big dice. This is one of the things that I carry around, because I'm not a clinician, and I'm not a statistician. Um, but I do, I am a, a researcher, I am a trialist. And so just as some clinicians might carry around their emergency kit, I carry my dice around with me, just in case somebody needs to be randomised. <laughs> if somebody needs to be randomised, I've got to be ready. I have to be ready, so I have my dice with me. Okay, so, so there's my, my dice, and it's, uh, it's a very precious uh, dice. It's very light, and it's, um, you know, you can trust it. So what do we mean by DICE? Let's go through, because this is, this is now a study that we call the DICE study. This was done by a group led by Peter Sandico several years ago now, a neuroscientist in Edinburgh. And they got a series of neuroscience, uh, people on a neuroscience course to roll DICE and to count up the number of ones or threes and count those as the events. When they did all of the trials together, so 1128 rolls versus 1128 rolls, not a lot going on. Yes, the numbers are different, but you would expect that by chance. That's what this result confirms. But each dice was of a particular color. And some of the students didn't write down the color of the dice. So we've got unknown, but that's missing data. It's not as though there's a dice and it has a color, but we do not know what that color is. They didn't write the color down. There were green dice, red dice, and white dice. And so there's the, there's the scatter. And again, it's just scatter. But 
if somebody came in with a rationale for if they couldn't write down what color the dice was, they probably don't know what they're doing, so discount their results. And if they used a red dice, well, a red dice, you always, yeah, red dice, we know what red dice are like, don't we? Don't include them either. So this is what that first subgroup analysis would say. Post hoc, but looking at the data, it looks as though there's something wrong with the red dice, so maybe we should leave them out because we want to know whether or not this stuff works. Every student did a first round of, tr of, of their experiment and then they did a second round of their experiment and this is what was seen that in the first round it was completely flat 109 versus 109 incredibly close you know almost sort of too close to be to be true the second round it was 71 89 so that's where the difference was coming from it was coming from the second round the students were told that maybe the dice are loaded and not only are they loaded, they're loaded in such a sophisticated way that the loading changes over time. Uh, I do not know if the students believe that and I don't know where they thought these, th these dice, these incredibly powerful dice would come from that actually change their loading as the clock ticks. Um, but what we then did when we took this data, we said, well, actually, in the real world, something else is going to happen once you've done this series of studies. What's going to happen is you will selectively decide whether or not to tell people about your results. So we do know, what we de then did was, we didn't say go off and try and write up your experiment and publish it somewhere. Dice, this um, is actually published, but the individual studies were not going to be published. But we said, let's model using what we know about publication bias. And what publication bias tells us is that about 70 or 80% of the positive trials will get published, and about 30 or 40 percent of the null or negative trials will be published. So we just loaded that in. So this is not, th 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 there's no chance in this. This is what the loading is bound to do. The loading is saying the positive trials, we took all of them and we said put, leave 70 percent of them on the graph. So we threw away 30 percent of the positive trials. And then we said take the null or negative trials and throw away 60 percent of them. Throw, the, throw it away. So we've got most of the evidence that would be left now would be from the published studies. The next step was to say, so what will the world think after this series of trials have been done? What the world might think is that the published trials, because that's what's access ex accessible to them, that the published trials that were done second by these students, because maybe these students were surgeons and maybe these surgeons learned so by the time they did their second set of trials, they were much better, so they were doing a surgical technique trial. This is how the logic could flow. So of course they're better. This result is now statistically significant. This result, if this really was an intervention in stroke, because this, this was uh, what these students were, they were neuroscience students, this would be 70 survivors per thousand treated, which is a fantastic treatment in stroke. If we, if we said, I've got a new drug, if I give it to a thousand people who've just had a stroke, 70 more of them will live to year two because of this treatment. We'd be jumping on it. It's purely the mixture that we get from a subgroup analysis, which is this one. The subgroup analysis is saying, let's go with the seconds, not the first, because clearly when they did it first, they didn't know what they were doing. They were still learning. We should just take the big signal from the seconds. It's rationale, perfect rationale. And then let's actually face up to the fact that the medical literature itself is biased. So as reviewers, what we're desperately trying to do is get this stuff out, get that unpublished stuff out, find that unpublished stuff as well. If we just find the positive, then we add it together, then we put a bit of spin on, we will get the wrong answer. So what does don't ignore chance effects mean? What do you think it means? There's a clue. What does don't ignore chance effects mean? What's the acronym for don't ignore chance effects? Dice. Dice. That's where, that's, whoever named this thing was obviously a statistician researcher from many years ago <laughs> who said, I will call that don't ignore chance effects. Oh, for shorthand, just call it dice. Don't ignore chance effects is dice. Or dice is don't ignore chance effects. So, this is just to sum up. Subgroup analyses should, where possible, be restricted to pre-specified, not just a select, uh, and a select few. The subgroups should be adequately powered to test the hypotheses. We should not be embarking in our subgroups where we actually can't test what it is we think of. They're not powerful enough. 
we're going to go in and we're going to reach maybe a 